Howdy everybody, it's time to geek out again, and um, with a little bit of a feedback that I got from the first episode, hopefully this time there will be at least 75% less um, stuttering and uh, insufferable repeating of myself over and over again as I struggle to think of what to say next. So uh, without much further ado, let's get started. So a few months ago... I decided that I wanted to design some very simple circuits that were meant to describe the relationships between as many units involved in electricity and electrical engineering as possible. And for the longest kind of time, I kept calling them demo circuits because I was actually planning to build actual working circuits. And I planned to do exactly that eventually. Um, but for now, though, I just have the circuit. I just have um, the first circuit down on paper. And last week, when I was working on it and you know figuring out how to add some more units and stuff to it, I ended up coming up with the idea of calling it the unit circuit, as kind of like a reference to the unit circle of trigonometry. And so the name kind of just found itself that way. This is the first of two circuits that I call the DC unit circuit because, well, it uses DC electricity. There's going to be a second circuit called the AC unit circuit. Um, I have not fully designed it yet. It's still on the drawing board. But once I get that done, I'll be making a geek out video about that as well. But for now, though, we're just going to talk about the DC unit circuit. And the circuit has a fairly simple setup. Uh, the most important thing to note about this circuit is that all components are ideal. Um, this term ideal in electrical engineering basically means that a component or a like a unit in an electronic circuit when it's described as ideal it exhibits pure characteristics that are not impeded by anything like equivalent series or equivalent parallel effects or it does not suffer any sort of leakage um, or for example it can exhibit infinite x or it can source or sink infinite x or absolutely zero x and stuff like that ideal components do not exist in real life at all but ideal components make it easy to conceptualize things on paper. Like for example, the idea of an ideal capacitor or an ideal resistor or something like that. So on this, on paper form for the DC unit circuit, all components are ideal. So the resistor exhibits nothing but pure resistance. The capacitor exhibits nothing but pure capacitance. In real life, capacitors have equivalent series resistance, equivalent parallel inductance because of inductive coupling between the plates and so on and so forth. Capacitors are just nasty little beasts. Uh, the inductor, for example, exhibits nothing but pure inductance. Um, and a voltage source, you know, obviously exhibits nothing but sourcing voltage. And it can do so up to infinite current as it, it'll, it will source as much current as is necessary to maintain its ideal constant voltage and it does so with zero ripple or zero drop or anything like that you know you connect a load to an ideal voltage source it won't drop it just holds that voltage and sources as many amps as necessary to you know satisfy the load so all these components are ideal that's number one the setup of the circuit and well you can kind of see it right here is actually really simple you just have an ideal voltage source dc voltage so you know positive terminal negative terminal um, connected in parallel across this ideal voltage source is a capacitor. If it's polarized, yeah, if it's a polarized capacitor, make sure, you know, your positive lead is connected to positive side. But for simplicity's sake, this is an unpolarized capacitor. And then connected in series across the positive and negative terminals of the voltage source. And also on, and also, um, on this side of the capacitor so that there's nothing else affecting the capacitor you have a resistor and an inductor in series with each other and this is just um this just marks like the position of like an ammeter to measure current through the circuit um this is optional but if you want to actually you know be able to do 
real life measurements of you know current through a circuit you're going to want an ammeter here and obviously you're going to want a voltmeter you know across these two points of the circuit as well it's kind of why i also combined the symbols for uh the for the dc voltage source and the voltmeter because a dc voltage source only has this plus and this minus a voltmeter symbol only has this v in here so i just combined the two to kind of um symbolize that you know you also have to have a voltage source connected across here to measure the voltage drop across the whole circuit so that's that and so that's the the basic lay, layout of this circuit so now i want to get into some of the labels that i've used with all this stuff here you'll notice that i use dt and delta t a lot throughout the circuit and if we look down here the difference between the two is DT is a reference to what I call the infinitesimal time unit and delta T is the discrete time unit. The infinitesimal time unit is basically what you get when you shrink delta T down to such a small value. Delta T is not zero. DT does not represent a delta T equals zero. This is what happens when you shrink delta T down to such a small value that it is immeasurable and it effectively represents an instant in time, just like that, literally just an instant in time. Um, and so what you end up getting is a period of time that is infinitesimally small, represented here by epsilon. Um, and then the discrete time unit is basically just a, is basically just a, um, a measurable passage of time. For example, in this circuit, delta T equals one second. Now, I was going to go off on a little bit of a tangent because I was wanting to talk about the uh, calculus involved with delta T versus DT, but it was too much of a sidetrack and it would distract from the rest of the subject matter of this. So I'm just gonna like move it off into its own little geek out video later because the epiphanies that I had regarding DT while working on this are like really big like epiphanies that will help me when i um in the future when i go back to college and i have to take you know calculus classes like multiple levels of calculus classes in order to get an electrical engineering degree so i'm totally going to be doing a geek out video about this but it's going to be a separate video because i just want to focus on the unit circuit itself so now let's talk about all the labels in this circuit. I've color coded them to kind of indicate which ones are uh, static properties of various points around the circuit, which ones are derived, um, but are still, but are still um, instantaneous measurements, and which ones are calculated as a function of the passage of time. So first, let's go through the uh, let's go through all the labels that are d that are a DT. In other words, that are effectively instantaneous me instantaneous measurements made using the infinitesimal time unit. So over here with our voltage source, we have DT. We have a DT of V is 1.0 volts. So our ideal voltage source is putting out one volt. It will source as many amperes as it needs to in order to power the rest of the circuit. Now, if we look at our resistor up here, DT R equals 1.0 ohms. So our resistor has a resistance of one ohm. And as a result of this, uh, this also equates to a conductance of one Siemens. So we need to add that in there because Siemens, um, Siemens, or you know, G, the unit of conductance, like that, is effectively equal to one over R, just like that. Conductance is the reciprocal of resistance. So the higher resistance something has, the less conductance it has and vice versa. The less resistance it has, the more conductance it has. So this reciprocal one over R equals G can also be inverted. One over G is equal to R, just like that. And uh, this is actually 
This is actually a really neat little relationship between resistance and inductance. I'm just going to draw a little graph here. So we have resistance. Uh, let's see here. Actually, no. Not even going to worry about that. Not even going to label. We're not even going to label our axes for right now. Um, so what we have here is f of x is equal to r, right? Or something like that. So this line right here, this diagonal line, pretty much represents the resistance of something, right? So in that case, conductance becomes a function of resistance as the reciprocal, just like that. We're actually going to, I'm actually going to label this as f1 of x equals r. And then we are going to label this line as g1 of x is equal to 1 over f1 of x, which is equal to g. And as a result of this, and this is actually a really interesting, this is actually a really neat little relationship. It's actually very, very symmetrical relationship, but I'm going to save that for a future Geek Out video. But nonetheless, though, I'm actually going to give you a little bit of a hint as to how symmetrical this is. Because if we take f2 of x is equal to r, like that. So we're labeling this line right here, right? That means g2 of x is equal to 1 over f2 of x, which is equal to g, which is equal, also equal to 1 over r. Just like that. So. This is actually a really neat little symmetrical relationship. Again, you know, I'm going to cover this in a future Geek Out video. I guess when I make it, I'll probably put a link somewhere up in the corner for you to click on. But uh, anyways, we'll get back to that in just a little bit because I want to, I want to uh, cover up more of this circuit. So we've covered our voltage. We've looked at our resistance and, of course, conductance of the resistor, 1 ohm, 1 semen, right? Ohm's law, or at least the first equation of Ohm's law, dictates that one volt pushing current through one ohm of resistance will do so at a rate or at a current flow of one ampere. Basically, if you take this formula right here, rearrange it, V on R is equal to I. So voltage divided by resistance is equal to current. Or alternatively, voltage times one over R, which means voltage times conductance is equal to current as well. So conductance actually has some really nice relationships with resistance in this regard. So we have current flow of 1 amp. Now, let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at at least one of these derived labels. So Let's take a look at this second Ohm's law equation right here. IV equals P. Current times voltage, so 1 amp times 1 volt means 1 watt. This resistor is effectively dissipating 1 watt of power as 1 ampere of current flows through at effectively a pressure and electric difference potential of 1 volt. So our resistor is dissipating 1 watt of power. Now let's look over at this capacitor. I have it set so that the capacitance is 1 farad. Therefore, when we basically start the clock to energize this circuit, because this is an ideal capacitor, it will instantaneously charge to 1 coulomb because charge is equal to capacitance times voltage. Right here, 1 coulomb. And as a result, charge times voltage, so coulombs times volts, results in energy stored. So this capacitor winds up storing one joule of energy, which is actually you know a fair amount of energy. 
uh, you actually don't want to put your finger across a one farad capacitor when it's charged up to any voltage uh, because it will give you a little bit of a zing. Um, but because this is an ideal capacitor, ESR is equal to zero ohms, and therefore the RC time constant, you know, C times R is equal to T, or in other terms, RC is equal to tau. Because R is equal to zero ohms, you're basically multiplying zero times C, which is pretty much guaranteed to give you zero seconds. So the capacitor will instantaneously charge up because its RC time constant is zero. Now, on a real world capacitor, it has equivalent series resistance. Get these out of my way here for the moment. It has equivalent series resistance, so even a real capacitor will have a very, very tiny RC time constant, but it will have an RC time constant. But in the ideal world, an ideal capacitor has an RC time constant of zero unless a resistor is in series with it. Now let's look at our inductor. Our inductor has an inductance of one Henry, which is actually quite a lot of inductance. It's it's not hard to find inductors with an inductance of one Henry, but it's also not easy either, and they're not cheap. They're pretty big and bulky. Magnetic flux, in this case, through this inductor, because we have one current of uh, because we have one ampere of current flowing through this inductor of one Henry, we are generating a magnetic flux phi, represented by the symbol phi, of one Weber. Okay, so that's all of our that's all of our um, labels using the infinitesimal time unit. So everything that you would derive from instantaneous measurements at each instant you measure the circuit. So now let's move into the delta t labels. Everything that happens with regard to the passage of time. So first, let's start off with current. So for each second that one ampere of current flows through this closed loop of the circuit, not the, not the capacitor, we're ignoring the capacitor now, but every time one ampere of current flows through this closed loop, we are basically transferring one coulomb of charge. Current times time is charge. For each second that the resistor effectively dissipates one watt of power, our circuit uses one joule of energy. This is also where we get into uh, this is also where we get into the unit that's referred to as the watt second, which is equal to one joule. Like that. This also this also means kilowatt hour, which is commonly used in uh, which is commonly used in the electrical industry is also equal to 3.6 megajoules and I can represent and I can um, show this with just a little bit of math so one kilowatt hour over one and you have to imagine there's an implied times in there kilowatt dot hour is equal to 1000 watts over one kilowatt whoops not equals there times multiply multiply there we go times 3600 seconds per one hour and the reason I get this is because you know 60 square which is basically 6 times 6 times 10 times 10 which is equal to 36 times 100 which is equal to 3600 so 3600 seconds times one hour equals now I gotta go all the way down here so 1 times 10 to the third and I use this little cap so this uh, small capital E notation right here because it's just faster and more convenient plus calculators you know calculators have that EE button right there which is basically equivalent to you know X times you know 10 to the Y it's effectively your scientific notation button anyways so I use that because it's faster because it actually has connotations to this button so you know you can scream at me all you want that I'm not doing this right but whatever I don't care so you take that is effectively equal to 1 times 3.6 e 3 plus 3 which is essentially equal to 3.6 e 6 
which is 3.6 million. Just like that, or 3.6 megajoules. So that's where you end up getting the kilowatt hour and where it represents 3.6 megajoules because it comes from watt seconds. Now if we go back to coulombs here, you'll also see coulombs represented as ampere hours or milliampere hours. Same difference. One ampere hour is equal to uh, one ampere hour is basically equal to 3.6 kilocoulombs because you're basically taking the same 3600 right here, 3600 multiplying it by one because one ampere second is equal to one coulomb, right? So what about milliamp hours then? Well, you're basically taking one E negative three times 3.6 E three equals 3.6 E zero, which is 3.6 cool coulombs. And you'll see milliamp hours used a lot to rate the energy capacity of like, you'll, you'll, you'll see milliamp hours a lot to basically rate the energy storage capacity of like little, you know, alkaline batteries just like these. Um, like for example, this one probably has it somewhere on here. I would hope so. Alkaline pile, 1.5 volts. Uh, does not have anything. Okay, so sidetrack over. But you'll see milliamp hours used a lot to rate uh, little battery cells like that to basically tell you how much energy is stored in them. Um, and using milliamp hours like this makes the math a little bit easier so that you don't have to remember that, you know, one coulomb is equal to one ampere second and, you know, have to do all your conversions that way, whatnot. You can basically just take this milliamp hours and then do your math from there, like how long you, you can estimate how long the battery will last at a certain current draw by using milliamp hours. It just simplifies things a little bit. So we've looked at charge we've looked at energy let's move on actually um, now let's look into some let's look into some really weird relationships over time first let's look at our voltage source for every second that our voltage source supplies one volt for every second it's effectively generating in this one turn right here this is referred to as a turn by the way a complete loop in this one turn of circuit our voltage source is effectively generating a magnetic flux of one Weber or one Weber. Now I've seen this described or I've seen this defined in a different way um, that is not immediately intuitive and this is also not terribly intuitive in its own right as well. Um, I might go over that in the future when I understand it a little bit better but for now this is what I was able to find out. And then this resistor for every second that this resistor resists current at a rate of one ohm resistance, it is effectively equivalent to an inductance of one Henry. Ohm seconds is equal to Henry's, just like volt seconds is equal to Weber's, ampere seconds is equal to Coulomb's, and watt seconds is equal to joules. But these two are kind of weird until you start looking at the equivalencies, the, these formulas over here. And I'm going to show you why. So let's talk about the relationships. And this is, oops, this is the wrong color I want to use. Um, actually, let's use red, just so it's a little bit easier to see. So first off, we're going to write down, we're going to write down, you know, the equations that we want to, uh, I actually want to write down uh, the equations that we're going to be needing for this. So, for example, we want to find out why we want to find out why voltage over time is equal to magnetic flux, and resistance over time is equal to inductance. Now, if we go over here, 
we can actually find some other interesting little relationships. For example, current through inductance also generates magnetic flux. And uh, yeah, that's all I can find. So current through an inductance also generates magnetic flux. And it's this equation right here that actually unites these two together. Let me show you how. So we're going to start off with IL equals equals phi. So IL equals phi, right? Now, let's substitute L here for this equation, TR equals L. So IRT, whoops, IRT is also equal to phi. Oh, looky here, we have IR, Ohm's law. So if we take this, or substitute IR for V, we have VT equals phi. And there you have it. So that is how, that's essentially how these two weird equations are effectively related to each other. They're related to each other through these two equations right here. And it's really weird to think about, but I promise you, if you go on to Wikipedia and you look up the units, and yeah, you actually look up the units of Weber's and Henry's, you will find this relationship with time and with other units that you'd think they're not related to, but they are. You'll find this relationship, and it's the weirdest thing ever until you actually think about it. And it's just so, so really cool. Now, as far as like, all these random little letters over here you know don't ask me why i'm using these letters these are literally the letters that physicists decided to use to represent all of these concepts as dimensions and they have no, almost nothing to do with the units as well with the exception of you know for example v is voltage c is capacitance p is power e is energy t is time you know those make sense phi can make some sense if you think about it as magnetic flux like that but all these others just they don't make sense to me but they are the values that physicists chose to use in their equations so those are the values we're going to stick with but anyways this is the DC unit circuit this is how it unites 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 dimensions together effectively uh, yeah 11 dimensions together effectively 11 different units together in one simple little circuit that also represents the three passive components at the same time resistors capacitors and inductors these are your three basic passive components in this one simple little circuit and it just makes me absolutely squee with delight that i've that i've actually been able to figure this out that i've been able to learn so much from this circuit and it has given me so much enlightenment into how capacitors and inductors behave, particularly in DC circuits. And I can't wait to finish the AC unit circuit so I can make a so I can make another geek out video about all of this and explain to you explain to all of you just what I've learned from this. Because the stuff I'm learning from all of this is going to help me in the future when I go back to college to get a double E degree. And I promise you there will be future geek out videos both about um, this relationship between resistance and conductance and there will be a future geek out video about why I'm using DT and Delta T and the calculus behind it all. You know, I'll be explaining all of that in future videos, I promise. But for right now though, I'm just going to leave it right here with the DC unit circuit and just the simplicity of what it can represent. So in that case, um, I hope you enjoyed watching me geek out about this. So talk at you later.